Dave DeMaster here. Hey, Dave. Good morning. Hey, Dave. How are you? Good morning, Paul. Hey, Mead. How's retirement? Oh, pretty good. Staying busy. <laughs> well, you can't say I'm still going into the office because nobody's still going into the office. I actually have gone in about once a week for the last uh, uh, three or four weeks uh, because I'm emptying out my office. And each time I go, I fill up four very large trash cans with papers and and transparencies and slides and <laughs> yeah. everything else that I've kept since I was uh, uh, since I entered NC State. How long have you been in that office? Uh, we moved in about 1990. Into this <laughs> yeah, that's thirty years of accumulation. Yeah. Dave, Dave, tell us what the feeling, you know, when we retirement, when we throw away all the manuscript, all, all the, all the thing, even the reprint, do you think of what the meaning of our, our career, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, I had a lot of reprints, you know, I mean, a lot of the students these days don't even know what reprints are. <laughs> <laughs> I had piles of them. Yeah, it seems a shame when you see them now and you're sort of like, wow, that was a lot of trees that died and these are just sitting in a closet somewhere. Same with transparencies and slides. You know, I've thrown away thousands and thousands of slides. <laughs> you know, the only ones I've kept are with people in them. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I've, uh, you know, I like, like Steve Keel does and you do, you know, I've got a million slides of box cores and uh, casting cores and... Uh, yeah, uh, I, I've got filing cabinets full of them, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> Morning, Steve. it's a shame. Hey, Mead, how you doing, buddy? Good. And yeah, so the only the only thing that's different is that what's behind the box for is you know it's icy, it's tropical. It's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a yeah. little bit of that. So, yeah, I know what you mean. It is sort of when you, I mean, I've I've actually been fortunate to move a couple of times, and so I've had to be you know, ruthless and throw large amounts of stuff away at about every 10 years in my career. But it's always fun to sit down with all those slides and all when you do that. Well, what do you expect when you live on a sinking delta? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there is that, which not coincidentally is what I'm going to talk about. today. Yeah, cool. Looking forward to it, man. Well, I've, I've come across some uh, uh, chemical oceanography final exams from people like Brent McKee and Steve Keel and uh, a variety of people that I'm going to use for uh, blackmail. I figure oh I can Lord. I can get large amounts of money uh, so that I don't reveal those exams to their university. Well, and this is the perfect venue, right? If you're giving a talk globally and you pop up Steve's uh, screwed up oceanography exam. <laughs> Oh, how embarrassing. That would be brutal. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, my. Let me get rid of my share here so I can just be human for a while. Ah, there he is. <laughs> it looks like you have a nice sunny day. Yeah, it's pretty nice here. It's chilly in New Orleans, but um, yeah. pretty nice. I'm actually going in the field this afternoon up to uh, Island 63 in the Mississippi River to do some. I got a student doing floodplain work. Oh, okay. So it's going to be fun to get up there. Although, you know, nowadays when you're traveling, you sort of go look at the COVID map first and where are the worst outbreaks going? <laughs> yeah. Do I need one level of mask or two levels or, you know, do I need a hazmat suit? They can't make the vaccines fast enough. That's for sure. Yeah. You're not kidding. I told Vicki that uh, uh, I was going to watch a seminar this morning and uh, she asked who it was. And I said, it's the guy who drove the big truck and knocked the branch off of our our front pine tree. <laughs> wow, that does that, go back a long you way. You must have been driving down from Stony Brook to Florida or something, and you had a big van that was yeah. a little bit, little bit taller than the bottom branch on our pine tree. I sort of vaguely remember one of, you know, Chuck would make you do those massive runs down to Florida to load the ship. And, and I think I remember stopping at your house once for something. Yeah. I don't remember yeah. what it was. Yeah. Why we stopped at your house. I don't know. Maybe we just stopped to stay the night. I don't remember. I, I think you might have just stopped to stay the night. I don't think you picked up any equipment, but I'm not, I can't remember. 
And maybe that was the trip that I forgot who was in the truck with me. It might have been Jim Ryan that we drove into a riot in Miami where there were riot police throwing gas uh, and the protesters were throwing Molotov cocktails. And I got this giant rider truck down to the end of this street, you know, and the, there are like a hundred police in riot gear who turn around and look at me. <laughs> go, what are you doing here? <laughs> well, we're looking for a good crab restaurant, actually. <laughs> good oh, times. Yeah. Yes, good times. Okay. Need I ready? Yeah, sure. Whenever you guys are. Okay. Uh, let's start. Oh. oh my God, that was a lot of deep. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, uh, good morning and a good good afternoon and a good, uh, good evening to our colleagues across the world and uh, welcome you to this World River and the Delta System Salt to Sink webinar series. Today we invite uh, Professor Mita Allison from Tulane University uh, give us talk about uh, the Mississippi River derived sand, how much they reach to the ocean and particularly the human impact. Um, so uh, this week is uh, EU, you know, EU week, but uh, you know, uh, this uh, presentation will be live streamed and also archived on the YouTube channel. And if your student or your colleague uh, didn't get a chance to uh, partic participate in this live stream, then you can uh, pass this uh, the link to them. So uh, uh, Mead, uh, oh, okay, before I introduce Mead, I want to see uh, this coming Friday, our colleague from France, Professor Serge Benet, uh, he will talk about the run River Delta system all the way from the source to the to the sink, and so uh, please also come in this Friday at the same time. So um, Mead uh, received his bachelor degree from College of William Mary. Yeah, other College William Mary here, and also PhD from uh, Stony Brook in 1993 with uh, working with Chuck Neutral. I I I guess uh, is the project on the Amazon um, River derived sediment. Then as a postdoc at the Woods Hole, and then took, uh, took the first faculty position in the Texas ENAM, then moved to the Tulane University after a couple of years. After Katrina, um, he moved to uh, Texas University of Texas at Austin, UT Austin. And also later, uh, he, be uh, he knew he became a director and helped founding the um, Water Institute of the Gulf in the Bolton Route. And now he um, returned fully back to the Tulane um, seven years ago. Um, now actually he's the, the chair and the professor of the new department over there, Department of River Coastal Science and Engineering at the Tulane University. Mead has spent uh, um, almost 30 years studying the river derived sediment folks on the lowland delta and the coastal area, particularly all the way from the tropical Amazon system to even to the high latitude Arctic, uh, the river and the coastal uh, system. So uh, today we are very happy to get Mead to give us talk about the Mississippi River, particularly the sand part. We have already have a couple talks in the previous weeks. Sam Batley talked about uh, all the way the geological history of the Mississippi River from the Miocene all the way to Holocene to the even anthropogenic period. So uh, Kevin Shui talk about the sediment uh, dispersal on the Louisiana shelf. And so Mead, we're very glad to get you, you know, give us a talk about the sand portion of the Mississippi River. So now you can share your screen and put a presentation mode. Thanks, Paul. Uh, thanks for that generous and extensive uh, introduction. And thank you all for, um, for coming. I know it's uh, AGU time, although it's virtual AGU time. And I don't know whether that was a foolish or smart on my part, picking a date that fell during AGU when attendance would be down. So I do appreciate those that made it. And uh, thanks again to Paul for putting this on. It's been a great deal of fun to watch these talks. So I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, and 
So what I'm going to talk about today is, is sand, and I'm going to mainly talk about the Mississippi River, although Paul encouraged me to throw in other systems, so I'm actually going to mention the Mekong right at the end, but um, only for one slide. So, um, and, and hopefully this fits in well, like he said, to what Sam and, and Kevin have already talked about at various points. So uh, I'm going to kind of blend together um, three topics, which is, uh, let me get my slide to go down here if it will. Come on, there we go. Um, I'm going to kind of talk about how does sand move from source to sink or what do we think about how sand moves from source to sink in large sand bed rivers. Um, and I'm going to spend just a second talking about why do we care how much sand moves from land to sea. Uh, and then I'm really going to delve into um, a study that is still ongoing. This is unpublished work. And frankly, it's not even really thought through in terms of these results. Um, we have this massive study that has very applied goals funded by the state of Louisiana and uh, to, to look into this issue of creating diversions from the Mississippi River below New Orleans. And we uh, have collected a massive data set and frankly, this talk was a chance to just start digging into it since I don't have a student on it yet and thinking about what some of this might mean. So um, realize that this is half baked. And if you've got ideas and, and different alternative hypotheses, um, you know, please speak up. Uh, this picture, of course, shows the, the state we're in in New Orleans. This is a fanciful future of New Orleans where I call home. Okay, so um, let's start with uh, what rivers carry in terms of sediment that we can broadly define into the wash load and the bed material load. And I often criticize my students when they go and write a paper and then and basically just scan the internet for information about um, their topic. And so I thought it would be fun to actually go into Wikipedia and see what Wikipedia had to say about wash load and bed material load. And actually it's a fairly cogent statement. This is taken directly from Wikipedia. And it says first that wash load is almost entirely made up of grains that are not found in quantity in the bed. They tend to be very small. So the mud fraction and also some very fine sand and have a small settling velocity and thus the flow is, is capable of keeping them in suspension um, throughout the source to sink pathway. The composition of the bed load, or sorry, the wash load changes as the bed load changes. According to Einstein, all particles that are not significantly represented in the bed must be considered wash load. This means as the bed load moves downstream and the size of the bed load is reduced, so is the size of the wash load. So I think that last statement is important because, you know, overall what we're talking about is a fast way from the source to the oceans for fine material but because the energy of the system decreases as you approach the ocean, that proportion of the sediment load that, that behaves in this way actually decreases and becomes finer. Okay, so um, this is bed material load and what Wikipedia has to say about it. And it says that bed material load is the portion of the sediment that's transported that contains material derived from the bed. Bed material load typically consists of all the bed load, in other words, that that's moving attached to the bed, and the proportion of the suspended load that's represented in the bed sediments, which indicates, of course, that there is a transitioning of material and that moves back and forth between bed load and, and suspended load transport. It's generally coarser than 62 microns, that's the sand mud split, with the principal source being the channel bed. Its importance lies that its composition is that of the bed and the material in transport can therefore be actively interchanged. So what we're saying compared to the suspend or the wash load is that there is more of a slow pathway from source to sink that during periods of time where it's moving as bed load uh, attached to the bed, sliding, rolling, saltating, it's moving very slowly downstream during higher flow periods, it can some of it can become in suspension and move much like wash load quickly down the system and then transition in individual events. But the overall course then is that it takes longer for this material to make it from source to sink. 
So if you take that information and construct some maxims, or at least some of these things are things that we haven't really well tested, but certainly seem to, to me to um, be things that, that you can pull away from these basic thoughts about what is wash and what is um, bed material load. The first one is that the larger the sand particle, the more frequently it takes the slow route. And of course, we know bed load transport is on the order of you know, meters to tens to maybe hundreds of meters today as, as dunes translate down river channels. Um, suspended load is more in the terms of meters per second. So that's what I mean by the slow versus the fast route. Um, on average, a sand particle spins an increasing proportion of transport as bed load as it moves downstream. So if, if the slope of the water surface is decreasing as you approach the ocean, the energy of the flow is decreasing. Therefore, it should suggest that uh, as you move downstream, this slow versus fast ratio changes. And hence, you can envision an experiment where you where you induced or where you inserted particles into the system at the upstream source end of different sizes, and you track them downstream. And what you would expect is that if they all started at the same point in the source basin, the smaller particles, the wash load and the smaller portions of the bed material load would reach the sink faster than the, the larger particles. In other words, the mass flux rate would be higher. So these are all interesting ideas that give you a sense of how, as the energy of the system changes, um, potentially you can sort material from source to sink. So we know that there are a lot of complications to a simple I those simple ideas that I just threw out. Some of the complications would be things like, what if there's selective abrasion? Maybe different size classes are made up of different minerals and some are more abrasion resistant than others. We can actually selectively remove um, a, a size class from the system. Uh, what's obviously true in large river systems is that, that all the particles don't enter at the same point, right? We've got intermediate tributaries, sometimes all the way down to the deltaic end member where we have separate particles moving into the system. So that's gonna complicate this simple sorting picture. And then in natural systems, we have a tremendous amount of exchange between the channel and the adjacent floodplain in the alluvial valley. So as the, as the channel migrates laterally and cuts into floodplain material, it releases particles, including sand-sized particles. Um, we remove material during floods and overbank flow we have channel avulsions that can strand whole channels full of material. So this simple picture of how things move downstream is more complicated. I've put a little caveat here to say that because we've done a lot of river engineering in big river systems today, you know, we've hardened the banks, we've put in levees, we've done things to reduce these mechanisms. In some ways, the experiment of how stuff moves from source to sink has simplified significantly in these systems. Okay, and so one last maxim is that all bed material load and frankly wash load for that matter, particles will be reduced in downstream advection rate through what's called the backwater reach. And this is a term that's come into common usage over the last decade or two. Um, and I thought I would spend a second talking about what the backwater reach is. And for the first time, so some data from the Mississippi River. Uh, and this is a paper we published a few years ago, Thad Pratt and I, um, that had a very unusual experiment that I'm gonna talk about here, which was Thad works for the Army Corps of Engineers and we were able to put multiple boats out on the river at once and, and actually uh, do work at one section of the river while a second boat moved downstream by road and then reoccupied the river when the same water mass uh, reached that point. So we were able to follow a mass of water in a Lagrangian way um, down the lower 700 kilometers of the river at low discharge, and then we did it again at high discharge. And so this is the, the conditions um, as that pulse at low discharge was followed um, in this experiment. And here's the different stations that are occupied. And what you can see here, the dotted lines are the water surface slope. And you can see the water surface slope when you reach at low discharge down about 400 kilometers above head of passes is hop, 
which is considered the mouth of the Mississippi River, um, you see that the water surface slope decreases dramatically. And, and that reduces the, the flow velocity significantly. So if you look at the depth average water velocity during this period of time, you'll see that it's decreasing significantly. This is the high discharge study and the water surface slope still decreasing as you approach the ocean, but much more energetic. So the, the basic idea of the backwater is that you can strand material at, at low flow because there is an energy for it to make it to the mouth. And then during these higher flow events, when you kick up the water velocities and the water surface slope goes up, you can reinvigorate the flow. And that's how you get material out of that last reach of the river to the ocean interface. Now that uh, simple idea is really complicated because as you get to the lower part of the backwater reach in any major river, you start experiencing tidal conditions. And then as you get even further down in the system, you can, you can experience estuarine conditions. And so you go into a whole different set of processes that may control whether you release particles to the ocean interface. And I'm going to touch on that some uh, because the area we're going to be looking at is, is tidally modulated, but not um, estuarine. So just some more from that paper. This was the, the, the sediment results from just the low discharge study. And this is the total sediment flux uh, in tons per day. And you can see this dramatic decrease in the amount of sediment carried from about 700 kilometers above the mouth until what reaches the mouth of the river. And also you can see, here's a breakdown by the size classes with the, you can already see that the largest proportion of material carried at low discharge in the Mississippi River is silt um, and then clay and then sand is the lowest one. And all three of those size classes are decreasing tremendously at low discharge, which implies that there is a settling out of material to the bed where it is stored until the next high discharge. And I'm not gonna show you the high discharge result, but you will see that there's a pulsing of this material. And so you, there is a, a, a stored fraction early in the flood that is released and, and makes it to the ocean interface or at least to the estuarine part of the system. And so you can see that, that that holds true for all size classes. So even wash load is being stored in the, in the backwater reach during low discharge. And of course, sand is tremendously decreased. There's virtually no sand in suspension at low discharge reaching the mouth of the river. So hopefully that gives you a little more context. Now, if you go look at the bed of large rivers, um, you will see that, that the bed's grain size also decreases pretty um, consistently in large sand bed rivers as you approach the mouth. Here's three big river systems, the Rhine, the Mississippi, and the Ganges. Um, and this is the D50, the median grain size. And you can see as you approach the mouth, there is a reduction in the material size on the bed. So this whole idea of what is the bed material load, what is the fraction of of material that's in suspension will be governed by this. So that would suggest that not only is there a reduction of sand in suspension, but the size class of it is reduced as well as you approach the, the ocean interface. And so, you know, what are some of the things that might control why the bed gets finer as you move down? Part of it is, is the differential flux rate we talked about before, faster, smaller particles are making it faster and have a higher flux rate. That'll be one control. The transition from wash load, um, we just showed that there is a finding as material is raining out, there simply isn't enough energy to carry larger size classes down there. And so effectively you can think about how much of this is dilution where there just happens to be more fine material than coarse material. But if you get down to the lowermost reaches of the Mississippi close to the mouth, you don't see coarse sand even in a very, very, um, uh, limited fraction of the, the overall percentage. Um, and that suggests that, it, that in some cases, material is stranded en route, at least under present flow conditions. We just simply don't see it and it's stranded upstream and never makes it to the ocean interface under the present conditions. 
Okay, so uh, this is a data set we collected some years ago in the lower 300 kilometers of the Mississippi, just to show you in more detail that this finding of, of the bed uh, continues all the way down to the mouth of the river. So this is river kilometer 126. This is just below New Orleans, for those of you that know the Mississippi River. This is about 300 samples and they're the dark um, line is simply an interconnected dot pattern of, of all of the 300 samples. If you take the average across that, you'll see it's finding downstream around New Orleans. The, the, the bed material is, is medium sand. By the time you get down to the mouth, it's in the fine sand category around 150, 200 microns as the, as the median size. Now, a lot of the scatter in this plot from individual samples has to do with depth. If you take that whole 300 sample data set and you bin it by water depth, you will see that, that the coarser material is in, in greater water depths, 40, 30 to 50 meters water depth, and the finer material is, is up in the shallows of the river, which of course is a function of the river's energy. The thalweg of the channel is is higher energy and so it tends to winnow the finer sand and leave behind the coarser material. So there's both this downstream and then there's a cross-sectional differentiation of material in the system. Okay, so, so let's move on to the, my second question, which is why do we care about how much sand discharges um, to the ocean from large river systems? I'm gonna give you two basic science reasons and I'll give you two applied science reasons, right? And this is not an exhaustive list. Um, i say number one, that the framework element, as we all know of deltaic stratigraphic architecture tends to be sand, right? That, that, that forms channel deposits, point uh, uh, distributary mouth bar deposits, et cetera in the system, those from a hydrocarbon point of view tend to become the reservoir sands in a system. And so here's an example of a, a modern accreting Mississippi River Delta that many of you know of that's called the Wax Lake Delta that is on the Atchafalaya distributary that's building out into the Gulf of Mexico. And here's some nice bathymetry that John Shaw did a few years ago showing the, you can see the sort of bifurcating pattern of distributary mouth bars uh, and the overall growth of this feature. And this is some even older work that Jim Coleman and, and um, Harry Roberts did that, that shows that the growth of this feature is, is over a blanket of sand that's on the order of about five meters thick, that then the subaerial facies grow over this, but clearly there is a, a strong framework element that forms the firmament or the base of this deposit. And so one of the questions that's being asked in Louisiana today is we try and uh, rebuild land and build deltas using river sediment is, can you build a river delta without a sand um, basement like this to, to form a, a low compactability layer um, that you build the rest of the stratigraphic architecture on? Because if you don't, right, we just said that about 90% of the material being carried by the Mississippi River is fines. And, and so that makes up the bulk of the raw material you'd have to build land. Um, but what this shows is that it seems from a geological perspective that the sand plays a very important role in the overall architecture, even though it's the smallest component, at least in this system of, of um, the grain size makeup. This is some old work that, that Tom Bianchi did 20 years ago, and there's been more recent stuff, but I just pulled this one out to kind of show. This is a breakdown of organic matter that's contained within the bed material in the lowermost Mississippi River. And my point here is that when you're talking about sand moving down the system, you're also talking about a, a component of the organic matter that's moving along with that sand. And so, because organic particles are lower density, what you're really talking about is large particles that are sand size or larger that happen to hydrodynamically fit in with, with the transport characteristics of the sand in the system. And so Tom and his colleagues went in and they looked at the, at the they broke down the, the lignans within it to see the origin of the material. 
And although there was a mixture, um, the, the material that was encased within the bed material load on the bed had a much more woody signature than the material that was in active suspension, which was more like degraded soil carbon. And, and so that says that, that the system is, is fractionating the carbon, the particulate carbon that's moving down the system and the woody stuff, not surprisingly, is what becomes uh, a co-transport component of the sand fraction moving to the ocean. So, you know, does that, what does that mean when your organic material makes it out to the ocean? Well, I mean, that, that may mean that there is uh, a greater likelihood of burial of this woody material because it's harder to break this material down. So we're getting back to how organic matter is processed at a global level. I think that's an important point. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the applied side of why we care about sand in the system. And I'm gonna use the Mississippi as an example because it's a nice sort of um, uh, springboard into the rest of my talk. And so here is now the lower Mississippi River from Baton Rouge to the mouth at Head of Passes, at, which is a distance of about 400 kilometers. This is, sorry, this is an Army Corps document. So everything is in English miles. Um, and this is a combination of ports that form the largest port complex in the United States. Uh, here's some statistics about how many vessels use the lower Mississippi River, how many jobs it creates, what its economic impact is. So it's clearly a very important economic corridor moving goods by river because of course the Mississippi is connected to the interior of, of a large part of the United States. So, uh, today, it, the Army Corps spends on the order of 250 to $300 million a year to keep a deep draft navigation channel open up to Baton Rouge. That involves dredging down here in the lower part of the system and also what, what are called the crossings where individual bars um, switch sides of the river and you have a shallow point that, that tends to be need to be dredged on a regular basis. And so what you can see is that what you're dredging is the sand fraction, the bed material load, and the transport rate of that material through this lowermost part of the system really plays a very strong role in um, how much you need to dredge in a given year and a given flood. And this is about to get more complicated as you see this 45 foot um, designation here, we're about, we've just been authorized to deepen the, the draft channel from 35 to 45 feet. Some of you may know that, that the Panama Canal now is allowing larger, deeper draft vessels through what are called Panamax vessels. And so ports in the Gulf and the Atlantic coast are now competing to see if they can capture that, that business. And so the port of New Orleans and the adjacent ports have, have convinced people to deepen the port. So you're basically going to make this issue even more important in how you transport material or how sand moves through the system. Okay, and then the other, as many of you know, the other big issue in the lowermost Mississippi River uh, and in the Delta, the other problem is, of course, um, we're losing land at a at a astonishing and shocking rate. Where we've lost uh, about three thousand square kilometers of the Mississippi Delta in the last eighty years, and with rising relative sea level, we're going to lose on an order of that same amount. And just to give you a feel, that's um, uh, somewhere between the size of a of a Rhode Island and a Delaware that we've already lost. So we've already lost one of America's states in terms of the land loss uh, in the Delta. And of course, that's, that's a combination of, of global sea level rise and then sub variable subsidence that's found along the system as well as the lots of human um, alterations to the system that have cost us a lot of wetlands. So the, the state of Louisiana is looking at ways that we can rebuild land areas using river sediment uh, and just as importantly, as we move into an accelerating sea level rise scenario, it's about preserving what's left. So the sand fraction is part of this renewable resource, 
that the river is bringing down that we need a better understanding of how much there is, how fast it replenishes itself to be able to utilize that then to, to work uh, for coastal protection and restoration. So that kind of goes on to what are some of the strategies that are being used in coastal Louisiana. So the, the most expensive and the most, uh, at least on an individual project basis and the most uh, farsighted is this idea of river diversions that, that the lowermost part of the system has levees that were built for flood protection on both banks of the river that are reducing the flux of, of particulates from overbank flow into these wetlands and it has been a contributing factor to their overall degradation. And so the idea is to mimic the crevasse splay concept to cut a hole in the levee and to build controlled diversions that spill out into these basins, preserving the existing wetlands and also building new wetlands. The scale of these things is on the order of up to 75,000 cubic feet per second or 2,000 cubic meters per second. So this is the size of a, a moderate, uh, moderately large river by itself. So these are tremendously large flows that are being considered and have now been authorized to be constructed in the reach of the river below New Orleans. Here's kind of what they're gonna look like. Um, basically the idea is that you have a, uh, an entrance area and a set of box culverts that can be opened and closed. So these are controlled gated structures that allow flow down a conveyance channel that cuts across the the area where people inhabit and the solid wetlands and then dumps at the uh, at an outfall to begin building a splay deposit. And as you can imagine, there's a tremendous amount of engineering that goes on here, both in terms of building the structure on these less than stable substrates to moving things like railroads and roads and bridges and so forth to build these channels. So right now the costing is on the order of about a billion dollars US per project. So these are really large scale projects. They have gone through feasibility planning. They have been authorized it has been turned over to an engineering and design team who are designing these structures at this point, and they're beginning to go to refining also exactly how do we, where do we locate them and, and how do we operate them? And that's where our work came in. Here's some, some model runs of, um, this is the diversion on the other side of the river in the feasibility stage that were used to authorize the diversion. And these sort of show the amount of land building that would occur after 25 years and how it's increased if you have a larger diversion. And also how it's a combination, the success of the project is measured not just by how much new land it builds, but how much compared to a future with no project, you will reduce the loss of existing wetland in the system that remains. And, and that's been a powerful method, despite lots of opposition to get these things to move forward. Okay, and so here's the diversion area that, that is the diversion, the Mid-Breton one that I'm gonna talk about some river channel work here um, that we've been doing for the state in the last couple of years. And this is just sort of a quick, um, if you can see the, the uh, animation, a quick um, comparison of on the left, um, if you do no project starting today and moving out to a 50 year time horizon, how much of the basin will we lose? And then on the right, if the diversion is in place, how much will that reduce the, um, the land loss that's anticipated given predictions of global sea level rise rates, subsidence rates in the area, et cetera. So the, some of the key questions for designing a diversion that are related to the topics I'm talking about is where do you locate a structure to maximize how much sediment it captures? Because that's what you really want to do. You, when, when you open that gate, you want to get as much sediment through as you can. Uh, and also, how do you operate the structure to maximize uh, sediment and harmonize? So not just where you put it, 
but when you open it is something that's being thought about. At what periods where there'll be the most sediment in suspension, how do we reduce the amount of water to sediment ratio and because there are a lot of nutrients in that water and that may complicate the ecological picture in the basin. It, it's a pretty complicated thing. And these are just some different scenarios that have been thought about, about when you might open these structures once they're built in the next few years. And inherent in this, of course, is what I'm talking about, a better prediction of how wash load and bed material load move from a basin scale, when can we expect it to be arriving from upstream? And also what I'm really gonna focus on today in the last part of my talk is what's going on locally. In other words, are there, if there are very strong differences in the amount of sediment and suspension in, within a single reach of the river, that's gonna determine where you locate it and also to a lesser extent, how you operate the structure. I didn't bring a clock. How am I doing on time, Paul? Um, pretty good. It's nine nine thirty. You know. Okay. Half hour. Yeah, I'm I'm a little <laughs> little beyond halfway, so I seem to be doing all right. I should have brought my phone out here. I was sure it was going to ring, so I didn't bring it. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about a little bit of our early results from what we've done in the Mississippi Channel in 2019 and the early part of this year. And this is a report that just got filed to the state uh, in October. So you can see that this is completely new work and certainly is nowhere near ready for publication. But it's such a cool data set and so extensive that I thought I'd give you a preview of it. The other reason I put this up is to say that this was a cast of many people to make this happen, including people like Sam Bentley and, and Kevin Zhu. Um, it took three engineering companies and two universities to pull off the experiment we did. And at any one time during a, a field study, we had about four to five different boats in the river at one time. So this is the kind of thing I could never dream of as an academic, you're right, an NSF grant, you're not gonna be able to put four or five boats and, and all of these people on the river. And so the state allowed us to do an experiment for sediment dynamics that otherwise would have probably been an impossible goal for an academic. So this has been a lot of fun to, um, to get this data collected and we've gotten it all to the state now, although we're talking about doing more data collection in this flood year. Um, uh, we just haven't had a chance to think our way through what all this means yet. But I did wanna recognize my colleagues. So it's a pretty extensive um, data set. We've got boats doing ADCP. We've got boats doing water column sampling. We've got boats doing bottom grabs. We've got boats doing multi-beam and bed load transport. We've got seismic surveys. We've got aerial drone photography. We've got a team working on the batcher, which is the bank line area that floods at high discharge that's inside the artificial levees to see what control that has on, on the sediment flow in the system. So here's where we're working. Um, this, is, this is the proposed, as we came out of the feasibility planning for the Mid-Breton diversion, this was the area selected around what's called Wills Point. And of course it will go off here to the right into the, the, the Breton Sound Basin. And the other diversion, the mid Barataria one is down here at the very bottom of the map and will go off to the left into the other basin is the plan. And I've shown kind of a small area of multi-beam that, that of the channel that defines our project area. And so immediate, one important aspect I'm gonna talk about a couple of times is that immediately upstream of the study area is the US Geological Survey's last uh, or lowermost Mississippi River monitoring station at Bell Chase. And so they're out there about once a month over the last 20 to 30 years, monitoring some of these sediment parameters that we're looking at in detail. So it's a nice comparison to the long-term data set and also to what the USGS is seeing immediately 10, 15 kilometers upstream from our study area. Okay, so here's the river's hydrograph during uh, the last 
uh, two flood years that we've been working out here. And here are the seven individual studies that we did. Uh, I want to point out one thing is that that the interesting thing about this part of the Mississippi River below New Orleans is that it has a maximum flow that's allowed through the system that is uh, 1.25 million cubic feet per second or a little over 35,000 CMS. And that's because there are a series of flood control structures upstream of New Orleans. The one closest just off the, the, the Google Earth image to the left is called the Bonnie Carey Spillway. And when you reach the, the flood reaches that point of 1.25 million, they begin to open that flood control spillway and take water off, which goes into Lake Pontchartrain, which you can see up here to the, the north of the city of New Orleans. So effectively, that makes for a very interesting experimental area down here in the lowermost part of the system, because it says that we can have periods when the structure is open, which are these grayed out areas, because we've had some very large floods in the last couple of years. It's been open, it was open twice in 2019 and once in 2020. We can have periods where the flow stays um, almost stable uh, right around this maximum value of 1.25 million. So you can actually flow water over this certain section of the river at a very stable hydrograph for as much as a month or two and watch what happens. Now you can see there's still a little bit of variability in the flow because what's happening is that the, the Army Corps of Engineers is opening more or less of the structure upstream of New Orleans to take off more or less water as they gauge how much is coming down and trying to stay within this 1.25 million. So here's a, about a 20 kilometer reach of the river immediately below our study area that I pulled up multi-beam for, just so you can see something of what the channel morphology looks like in this area. This is not a highly meandering point bar um, morphology. Basically, we see a set of, in the lowermost river, a set of laterally attached bars that, um, that alternate between the left and right descending banks of the river and are on the order of a few kilometers long. So the sand is piled up in these, the bed material sand is in these bars. And then the, the, the thalweg, as you see, migrates back and forth across the channel as these bars alternate. And we did a study for the state some years ago um, that we tried to say, well, what are these bars? Because these are really important bars. Another one of the strategies that's being utilized by the state is long distance pipelining of sand, where they stick a dredge pipe in one of these bars and they pump sand out and they build land adjacent. And you'll see this bar at, at Bayou DuPont these little excavation scars are from those types of projects where you actually cut uh, the sand out with a dredge and you pump it to build land laterally. So the state's asking questions about how mobile are these bars? How long does it take them to, to um, restore themselves with replenished sand coming from upstream? And my takeaway from this study where we tried to look at historical data from the bars is in some cases we have decades of data in these individual bars and they don't seem to move very much. They, they change in their elevation and they expand and contract a slight amount, but they're not moving downstream. So this morphology is fairly stable in the lowermost river. And, and I've still got a remaining question as to why that is. Is that because we no longer see a flow because of the flood control structures that's large enough to, um, to actually begin to translate these bars downstream? Or is it that we have built levees and we've started to straightjacket the river so it can't migrate laterally? These are really interesting questions that are still remaining, but, but certainly these bars are, remain relatively stable. And hence, if you're gonna consider where to put a diversion, the locations of these bars being stable is a very critical part of that decision. Okay, so here's our field area um, and here's your, our extensive data set. These are all the stations. There are about 60 
I think about 64 stations in the main grid area. And somewhere along this reach of Wills Point is where the diversion will be ultimately built. And so as part of this design and engineering, we're trying to understand from a river supply perspective, where's the best point to, to build an offtake in the river to maximize sediment capture. This figure on the left is upstream of this point. You can see these data points are over here as well. Just to show we had a little bit of data that went on all the way up to the USGS site at Bell Chase to tie our data sets together. But what I'm gonna really talk about is what is uh, the data at this bar at Wills Point for now. Uh, so suspended sediment is where I'm gonna focus the first part and then the, I'll talk a little bit about the bed. Um, the suspended sediment was collected by standard USGS methods with a point integrative isokinetic sampler where you collect from uh, five uh, points in the water column, point one, point three, et cetera, of the total water depth of a station. Uh, and then if you do an ADCP acoustic Doppler across to calculate water discharge, you can use a binning method and calculate a total uh, load of material moving past each one of these transects. Now, unfortunately, the engineering teams told us exactly where they wanted their stations because basically they're building a set of numerical models that this data will be used to calibrate and validate the models. And so these are where they thought would be the best to get information. So notice, for instance, they're not evenly spaced across the river. The, the uh, right descending bank, which is the Thalweg here, is not sampled at all. So I wouldn't have designed the experiment like this and it, if I was just looking at sediment dynamics um, to understand what's going on on this bar. But so we're working within some constraints. We do have a fair amount of replicate sampling to kind of give us a sense of how much uh, there is a pulsing nature of sediment in suspension at these locations. Okay, so here's a sense of a flavor of the suspended data. This is from event two, uh, a very high discharge. This is one of these periods when the Bonnie Carey spillway was open and we're at a stable maximum discharge. We actually saw that in several of these events. I'm talking about a period here in, in March of 2019. Um, and, and I'm mainly gonna talk about that event because I've got so much data, it's hard to get your head around all seven of these events, uh, but I'll show you a little bit of some of the other data. So we've got 65 stations of data with replicates. We've got more in the bottom. If you take an average over all of those stations during this event sampling, notice that the fines concentration from surface to bottom is very consistent. So. In other words, the less than 63 micron material during a flow of this size is clearly uh, wash load, right? There is, it's well mixed from water surface to bottom. The sand load on the other hand does show a nice Rousian distribution of increasing concentration as you approach the bed, which is an indication, a Rouse profile is an indication that the bed is providing a source of material to the water column. In other words, this bed material load at this high a flow is translating into suspension, or at least some of it is. Um, and there's a balance between that turbulent upward force and the gravitational settling force that gives you these types of profiles. Notice also the wide variability from individual samples, which you don't see except maybe at the very bottom in the finds. There's a tremendous variability from station to station and in replicates, there's a tremendous variability near the bed of material uh, in suspension and the concentration of material in suspension. So this is kind of cool. This is a calculated sand load in suspension for each of these transects. Now, this the whole experiments were designed to be done over a three-day period so that you can capture a, a fairly consistent discharge. So we don't see, these differences are not driven by discharge. We have a stable discharge. And yet the sand loads calculated vary by a factor of two in how much sand is moving past this transect. That's a pretty stunning figure. We've never had this kind of data at this type of detail to see the level of uh, variability that can occur in a small spatial scale. 
Now this one is very strange, the one I highlighted here in, in purple. Um, I'm gonna come back to why this one is showing a very strange difference from the others in a minute. But if you take the fines at the same time, notice how consistent the fine loads calculated are through the whole reach. The variability is much less than a factor of two. Now, if you look at it from a station perspective, these are the depth averaged uh, sand concentrations in suspension for each one of the stations in milligrams per liter. So remember, there's more sand at the near bottom. So this is averaged over the whole bottom. The, the, the base, I'll show you the lower part of the water column in a minute. The, the lower part of the water column is much above this, this mean value. But notice that there's very low sand concentration on the bank line but there's, which you'd expect, this is the lower energy zone. But out here at the edge of the Thalweg, I've underlain the, this is the multi-beam collected during this three-day period. So this is exactly what the bed looked like at the time we were sampling. And you can see that the Thalweg over here, the stations that we have in deep water also have less sand in suspension, despite being higher energy. So this belt along where we have the large bed forms on the bar is where the, the sand is concentrated in suspension. Here's the greater than 25, 125 micron sand in just the lowermost two samples. And again, you see um, it's concentrated along the zone where we have large bed forms along the bar. Now, just to give you a flavor for how a different event would look, here's an event from event five in December of last year. This is about half the maximum discharge we saw in the previous, and this is the same scale. And if you scale it at this same 100 to 200 micron range, you see that all the stations have less than, than 100 microns in suspension. That's not surprising, right? Lower flow energies, less of that bed material load has translated into suspension during a flow of that size. But if you zoom in and, and change the concentration scales to below 100, you can still see there's a concentration of sand in suspension over the section of bed forms, largest bed forms on the bar. Notice the bed forms are a lot smaller. If I go back to event two, you can see the decrease in the size of the bed forms at the lower flow. Okay, so this, this kind of concentration over the bars is something, and over the large bed forms is something that a student of mine, Mike Ramirez, published on, I guess the paper is about 2013. And this is from another bar, another 20 or 30 kilometers down the river from this site. Uh, these are a couple of figures from his paper. And you can see here are five different points on the bar at different discharges as we step up from about 18 to this maximum flow that's allowed. You can see the bed forms are getting larger. You can also see the zone of largest bed forms is migrating from the deepest part of the bar here at moderate discharges up to the shallow part of the bar. So that would imply that you're actually causing deflation of the bar at, this, at the highest velocity flows here on the deeper part and the active bed form field is moving uh, up onto the bar uh, through time. And that, that's what we've seen in this study as well. This is acoustic uh, backscatter that's been calibrated to sand concentration using the isokinetic data from these five periods in Mike's study. And you can see that the bed is the source of material for this sand in suspension. And as you increase the, the flow on the bar and you build these bed forms, the turbulence induced by the bed forms kicks up a tremendous amount of sand into the lower part of the water column. And so it's, it's this phenomenon that the state is and the design team is really interested in because if you can if you can capture that sand that's coming from the near bed and have it flow through the structure then you can deliver a lot more coarse material to the receiving basin so exactly how much flow you need because you can see it's decoupled from the bank line exactly how much flow you need in order to suck that sand rich material into the structure is going to be critical to the efficiency of capture of this coarse material. 
just to show you, this is the bed at event two back to the high discharge one. And uh, most of the bed material, so this defines, as we've said before, the bed material load, most of it is fine sand over this area of, of action. As you move into deeper water, just like I showed you earlier, where it's more energetic, that fine material is winnowed and the bed becomes medium sand. Um, and then there's mud. You can kind of see it here. There's a definition between what is the active sand field and what is old exposed mud substrate along the bank line. And that's what this is. That's why you're picking up mud in the, in the grab samples at the bottom. Now I promised you I'd show you what was going on with that strange um, uh, discharge, sand discharge number I was getting down here in the lower part of the system. And you notice that we're tailing off this bar, we're coming up to a bar crossing, and yet we're still getting very high sand loads in suspension down here. And if you look at the ADCP, what's happening is that you have a secondary flow structure here. In other words, there is return flow moving upstream at relatively low velocities along this bank line. And at the interface between that upstream moving flow and the fast moving downstream flow, you generate a tremendous amount of turbulence along this interface. When you're out here in a boat trying to sample this, staying in one place is almost impossible. It's like giant eddy whirlpools that are spun off this interface that have trees in them that you're trying to stay on station to collect a sample at high flow. It's a pretty in, in interesting experience to try and sample this interface. But not surprisingly along this turbulent interface, this is this transect right here. This is the velocity magnitude. So you can see this upstream flow is moving very slow, but along this interface with the fast moving downstream, you can see the tremendous um, turbulence is inducing a high backscatter. So there's a lot of sand in suspension along that interface between the secondary flow and the main downstream flow. So it's a very complicated spot. One of the, and this is not uncommon in these, in these subtle bends in the lower river that you get these secondary flow structures. And the big question is, well, this is sand right next to the, um, the bank line. Is this a place you want to build your structure? Um, but how will you affect that secondary flow structure when you start pulling water off? If you put it up here, will that cause this, this secondary flow to migrate further upstream that might affect your structure? So there's a lot of small scale uh, effects that are going to determine how well they can capture sand in these areas. So just uh, to kind of move to the end of the suspended load, I took the, the, as we said, the USGS stations collect data about once a month uh, at upstream of our field area. And that's what these blue dots are in suspended sand load. And then here's our maximum transect values mean and our minimum of what I showed you on those 11 transects before. And notice that in terms of sand loads, we're seeing a much higher number than, than what they're seeing immediately upstream at the USGS site. The USGS site is actually at a bar crossing. They decided to put it at a location where they didn't see these bar effects. But what that means is that their values are equivalent to our minimum values. In other words, in many cases, we're capturing two or three times the amount of sand in suspension that they're seeing. So what does that mean if this long-term monitoring station is being used as an, a, a way to calculate the flux to the ocean? It means that there's a tremendous amount of small-scale spatial variability in suspended sand flux as material moves through each one of these reaches in the lower river. This is the fines, and you see the fines line up pretty darn closely with their data. Okay, let's, let's finish up by talking about the bed a little bit. Uh, as I said, we have bed load data where we do repeat multi-beam mapping. We go out 24 hours apart and we map the bed and we look at the translation of the bed forms and we can calculate the sand flux rate from that. This is something we started back with Jeff Nitrauer's master's thesis that was published and we've published on this a number of times. So I'm not gonna 
go into detail on this, but um, the cool thing here is that we had a crew just doing this and they did three different areas, an upper part of the bar where they did a repeat grid, the middle part, and then the lower part of the bar. So for the first time, we can actually calculate a different bed load transport rate for different points on the bar because we have enough data. And if you do that, we see generally the trend is what we've seen in previous studies that there's an exponential increase in bed load transport as we increase the discharge. So the bed forms are getting bigger, but they're also moving faster. And so we see this exponential increase in the sand flux as bed attached material. But for the first time, we can actually see that the upper part of the bar, the sand is moving faster than it is at the lower part of the bar in these uh, higher flow studies. Notice that it's reversed in the lower flow studies. So there's some very interesting dynamics that are suggesting that the flux rate on the bed is varying as we move down the face of the bar. I, the first thing I looked at was to say, well, does that mean the bar is either deflating or uh, a grating? And so because this translation method allows you to calculate both an accretion and a erosion rate from the same translation of bed forms, you can actually make an estimate of whether one is larger than the other. If the accretion rate is larger, that would suggest that the bed is a grating. If the erosion rate is larger, that would suggest the bed is deflating. And in fact, when I did that, I can't see a whole lot of difference. So it, it doesn't look like to me that there is any net change in the surface of the bed. There's simply a slowing of the rate of bed form migration as it moves around the turn. And this is somehow tied back to the translation of material in suspension in ways that I haven't completely winkled out yet. Uh, this is kind of cool. This is event three uh, in April versus event one. This is a period where, as I said, the spillway was open above us. And so we had a stable discharge, maximum discharge for over a month passing over the bar. And so this is just a differencing of the, the three event bathymetry from the one event bathymetry. It defines very nicely the limits of the bed form field, right? Because the bed forms are located at different points in April than they were in, in um, February. So that's where you see the most change. And very nicely shows that there is no sand moving along the bed in the near bank line. And also shows that the thalweg is not carrying a significant amount of sand. Most interestingly, if you take these three field areas that we just showed bed load rates, we can actually see a change in that over a longer term period, we couldn't see it in a two day comparison, but over a one month comparison of high flow, we're actually seeing the upper part of the bar deflate and the lower part of the bar accrete. So the bar is starting to show evidence in a sustained period of high flow of trying to move downstream, which I think is really interesting. And we've never had this level of data to see this. The Thalweg, if you do this comparison, got on the order of a half a meter deeper during this period of high flow. So we're actually scouring the Thalweg where we have the maximum energies of any sand and we're exposing the underlying, in this case, Pleistocene substrate. And there's some subtle patterns in here that the deeper part of the bar is seemingly deflating and we're accreting on the shallower part of the lower end of the bar. Now that's kind of what you'd expect if flow is reaching a maximum, the energies are such that you'd be scouring this area and this would be a concentration zone. So, so we're starting to see, and I haven't dug into all of these studies to compare this, but we are starting to see some very subtle patterns in how the bar responds to high flow periods. Okay, so to finish up, um, what does all this mean from a, uh, this, what I call the lower river modulator? What does this mean for how sand makes it from the upland to the ocean? And, and what I'm talking about today is somewhere in this unidirectional tidal zone. Our field area is in a place where there's a little bit of tidal modulation, but we have a very small tidal range in the Gulf. We have about a 30 centimeter diurnal tide and so we never see reversing tides in the mouth of the river. 
During high flow, we don't have any estuarine conditions. So all the fresh water pushes the, the salt wedge out of the river. And this lower area shows a little bit of reduction and increase in flow velocity with the tide. Um, and so it's not technically the backwater area itself. Now I would compare that to somewhere like the Mekong where you have a much stronger tidal uh, flux and tidal range. Here, you have the same categories, but then you, before you get to the ocean, you get into this reversing tidal reach. In other words, during the high tide, the, the, the flow is moving downstream during the incoming tide. Um, the flow is moving upstream. We'll see a total reversal in flow direction. So clearly that's a much more complicated mechanism for how you release sand to make it to the ocean interface itself. If I compare that to low flow, so this was high flow, low flow, all these situations move upstream with less uh, freshwater flux. The salt wedge moves into the lower part of the Mississippi River. And so that becomes estuarine conditions become a complication and affect a trap for releasing either sand or much of the fines during low discharge, as I showed you earlier. To the ocean interface and and the reversing remains in the in the Mekong and but the estuary actually gets less mixed because or more mixed sorry because less stratified because there's less fresh water effect to stratify the situation and just to show you one figure from something my student Drew Stevens published a few years ago Paul and Dave and some of the other folks on the call were part of this Mekong study um, this is a really different situation. So I've been showing you high flow in the Mississippi River. This is high flow in the Mekong at Transect C, which is in this reversing tidal zone. And this is a combination where we went back and forth across the channel over the entire tidal period of 24 or 25 hours, collecting isokinetic data and measuring water discharge with ADCP. And so here's the water flow uh, instantaneous discharge, uh, flooding versus ebbing tide. Here is the measured isokinetic values. And then this is the backscatter uh, ADCP calibrated using these values to develop a calculated sand flux. And what you see is the sand flux, of course, varies with the, um, with the, with the instantaneous discharge during the the um, flooding tide where you slow the river's velocity, you actually get sand flux and reverse it. You actually get sand fluxes upstream uh, and then it moves downstream when you have the ebbing tide and the combination of the river flow on top of it. Notice at high discharge, the offset of this, it's not balanced. So th this shows that this is the period in a reversing tidal situation where you can release sand to the ocean because basically the effect of the river magnifies the effect of the, um, the outgoing tide and creates much hard, larger offshore flux values than onshore flux values during the flooding tide. So that's just to show you that, that each one of these systems is very specific in terms of um, how it releases sand and bed material load to the oceans. So my last slide, um, some basic takeaways that the bed material load downstream flux in this lower mode reach of the channel. It's primarily releasing material during high discharge as we showed. Um, there just simply is enough energy to, to push it all the way out to the ocean. And we also have an estuarine trap at the far end during low discharge. There are subtle small scale spatial scales between the that on a very small scale of a single bar, you can see very large differences in how much of the sand is moving downstream in suspension versus how much of the sand is moving downstream as bed load. And clearly there's a fractionation by grain size that flux rates we are seeing are higher for finer particles, including in the bed material load size classes. And, um, the last point I made is that each system's modulator of how sand makes it to the ocean is unique. And it's only really partly driven by differences in water discharge, as I've tried to show you. There's some 
there are some smaller scale effects that um, that are controls on this that we've just begun to peel away. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna come off of sharing so you can see my mug again and ask you any questions. Yeah, thank you so much. It was such a, a comprehensive uh, view about the Mississippi uh, River, particularly the sand portion transport to the sea. And it's, it's a great. So uh, now uh, if you have any question and uh, try to uh, make your question as short as possible and me try your best to make your answer as short as possible. You know, yeah, I'm people. sorry to go on a little long. That's where I yeah, should have brought, a, I should have brought a, a clock out with me. That's fine. I mean, it's, it's good. I mean, so we all enjoy. And so please go ahead. If you have any question, unmute yourself, raise your hand or whatever, to just uh, speak out. Anybody? So, so yeah, yeah, Dave, go ahead. You had to unmute yourself. Uh, Mead, I was wondering if there's a heavy mineral story and how it how density might vary versus grain size. You said there are grain size fractionations, but I'm just wondering if you followed any heavy mineral movement through these systems and if how they differ from kind of grain size dynamics. I think that would be a, a really good dissertation. I mean, I've, I've certainly seen when you look at the, the bed samples and you do a transect from across the bar down to the Thalweg where you're in that deeper, higher energy, coarser fraction, you will see more heavy minerals in that. So there is definitely a density um, sorting effect going on here that's buried within that. We'll see, like for instance, one of the only things I'll see that's coarser than medium sand is we'll see coal fragments, that there are coaling facilities along this stretch of the lower river. And that's where you get gravel sized pieces of coal and they'll all be concentrated down there in that fraction with heavy minerals, uh, as well as the human refuse. We pull up all kinds of like, you know, uh, pots and pans and bottles and things like that. And, you know, so anything that's denser or larger ends up being stratified by size by density as well as size but coal density must be quite low i would guess it is pretty coal so it is pretty small so these pieces are like pea gravel and larger so they stand out pretty clearly in the in yeah. the in the in the crabs great talk enjoyed it a lot thanks hey, david hey hey me a quick question you know the very old traditional question how much of the bad load the sand portion in the total sediment load you know, classically, people always assume 10%, but it looks like your survey, your data show much more than the 10%. Well, I mean, if, you, if you're just looking at what's translating in the bed forms, as I said, it goes up exponentially with, with discharge. And so at that maximum depth, at that maximum rate we see, it can be up about 40% of the total sand flux. That can be a really large number. Sure. But... As you move down that scale, it gets much less than 10%. Uh -huh. But the interesting thing is when you fall below about 17,000 uh, CMS, there's no sand in suspension. And so it goes back to 100% of the translation or movement downstream is by bed load. There are small bed forms, mm -hmm. but they're still moving downstream. But their overall flux rate, even though they're 100% of the total, is really tiny. So... It's an interesting, you know, the size and the translation rate of the bed forms is also a part of this equation. Hmm. Interesting. Any, anybody else? Hey, yeah. Hey, have a question? You had to unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, you have to do it for me, I found out. <laughs> but you did. So I guess you can hear me, right? Yeah, yes. Okay, good. Um, yeah, great. Thanks, Mead. Uh, uh, it's good to be up to speed on uh, what you've been up to uh, lately. Um, so, uh, you know, the one, the one slide that really struck me was uh, where you showed those depth averaged uh, grain size comparisons. Uh, and just looking at the scales, 
the implications seem to be that you actually have more sand that is moving than fines. And which is, of course, you know, if you just think of the conventional wisdom that, you know, the, the rule of thumb is that at least 80 or 90 percent is, is, you know, wash load, generally, you know, mud fractions. Uh, is this unique to these very high discharge events? So if you look at, you know, an average or low flow situation that you find a completely different ratio? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's unique to that. It's also unique to the location. So, you know, by building a diversion on top of this bar where you have this magnification of sand flux because you have these large bed forms that are inducing turbulence, you're magnifying that effect. So you're right. If you look at our suspended sediment values, they can be five, six, seven hundred milligrams per liter in those lowermost samples at a time where we've got less than 100 milligrams per liter of fines. The fines is really driven by the basin effect, right? It changes yeah. day to day due to hysteresis and those types of things. And so, but that variable is never more than say one, 200 milligrams per liter these days in the Mississippi, because we're, we're much more efficient at keeping fines in the upper part of the basin than we used to be. Yeah. Um, but yeah, locally, you can see these really accelerated values. But if you go up to, to the USGS site, which is kind of in a U-shaped point in the river where there's no bar, they don't see those kinds of really high near bottom values. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> just a very quick follow-up. So in relation to the diversion, what seems to be the really crucial issue is how stable those bars are over time. Because of course the nightmare scenario is that you think you've picked the right spot, you make this giant investment, and then perhaps as an unintended consequence of the construction or something, maybe something else, the whole bar starts migrating downstream and suddenly you're <laughs> in a sand desert. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's one of three really issues that keep these, these modelers awake at night from the channel side. There's that one. There is, if you start pulling off that sand that's caught up in this cycle, will you actually deflate the bar in place and you'll actually see a declining capture efficiency? The yeah. third thing is, if you pull off that much water, you're reducing stream energy downstream. Will you actually start to see the bed a grade downstream and start to, to hinder the navigation channel? And yeah. so all of those things are very delicate knobs that have to be looked at. And the, the beauty of a gated structure, of course, is if things are getting bad, you just close it for a while and, and hopefully the system will recover. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. You know, actually the mid the divide, the division happened naturally always. I mean, when they break, the levee break up and always, you know, but uh, just like uh, the beach nourishment, I think somehow the engineering is sometimes maybe short term very effective, but long term, who knows this is good or bad. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, they're trying to mimic a natural process of crevassing and splaying. And then there's a whole nother set of issues on the receiving basin side, like, you know, will the growth of this feature ultimately make it more difficult to pull sand into the system? And that's a question that's being asked as well. Sure. As, as for any, any other question? Um, well, I do appreciate everybody hanging on this long that's there. Yeah, if, if not, Amit, thank you very much. And if possible, you can modify your presentation and, you know, you can share some of the, you know, material to the student of this community. I think, uh, we all will benefit in the women's situation. Okay. And you can send me a link of uh, Dropbox or Google Drive, you know. So, but anyway, so this coming Friday, uh, Professor Sergi Benet, you know, we will talk about the Mediterranean Sea, the Rhine River Delta system. So, uh, mark your calendar if possible, please also come here to join in the talk. And uh, then after that, so I